Let's just read Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates, lift up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Amen. Let's stand and worship him. And we do declare that, Lord, and we say yes and amen to that, that you are the King of glory. And we really do pray that the King of glory would be welcomed in this place, this day. We pray before we even come and worship you, Lord, that you would cleanse us, that we truly may be people of clean hands, pure hearts. Forgive us, Lord, where we have sinned against you, where we've in thought, in deed, in action, in heart, have been contrary to you. Would you purify us by the blood of Jesus Christ, that truly we may be, be here this day a people of clean hands, pure hearts, able to descend, uh, sorry, ascend your holy hill, and come in, Lord, into this place, into our hearts. Fill us with your glory, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.
Well, good morning, everyone. No, no, no. Let's do that again as usual. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Come on, man. Yeah. You know, when you're out of church for two Sundays, you come back, man, you realize what you've missed with that praise and worship. Huh? I mean, sure, what a thing. Huh? All right, let's just pray. <clears throat> Father, I want to thank you this morning that we can come to you in Jesus' name. And Father, as Peter Pollock also always prays, that if you don't, know, uh, if you don't anoint your word, Father, it will amount to nothing. Father, and therefore I pray that you will anoint your word, that it will fall on fertile ground, Father, that it will stick the Heavenly Father. I pray that you will undertake by your might, your Holy Spirit. As we sang this morning, you're an awesome God, the Heavenly Father. And I pray this morning that you will do awesome things in our hearts. Thank you for your goodness, all your grace, in Jesus' name. And all God shall say, Amen. Amen. <clears throat> all right, you can turn to Philippians chapter 2. I'll be reading the verses we'll be working at is verses 14 to 16, but I'll just read a bit before and a little bit after to put it into context. Have, have we got it on? My spirit on there, James, because I read too fast. <laughs> is it on? Okay, great. It says, I read from verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do all things without murmuring and disputing. Now that puts nicely in with uh, what Luzon read this morning. That you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as a light in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Yes, and if I'm poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I'm glad and rejoice with you all. For the same reason, you'll also be glad and rejoice with me. But as I said, we'll just look at verses 14 to 16, otherwise we'll be here the whole day, which is also not bad, is it? <laughs> so, it's very interesting that these couple of verses fall right in the middle between the example of the humility of Christ and then the humility of Paul and of Timothy and of Epaphroditus. Jesus gave up his glory, came in the appearance of a man, became a servant, obedient, obedient to the point of death. And it's in the context of work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now remember now it says there, don't work at your salvation or work for your salvation because you can't. It says work it out. And wrap it like a present. Uh, like a present, it's very precious. Do it with trembling and fear. So, and these verses now, from verse 14 to 16, explain to us how to do this. How do you work out your salvation in trembling and fear? And you know, there are eight ways in those three verses, 14, 15, and 16. There are eight ways of how to do it. In verse 14, it says you need to do something. It says. Do all things. In, uh, um, 
And then it says, in, in order to become something, to become blameless and harmless, to become it in a certain way, faultless, in a certain place. Where is that certain place? In the midst of, or, or, or at a certain time, in the middle of, all right? And then in a certain place, in the place of a certain generation, in which you are something, holding fast to something in order for someone to rejoice. All right, I'll just uh, repeat those eight things again. It is to do something, do all things, in order to become something blameless and harmless, in a certain way, faultless, all right? In a certain place, in a certain generation, at a certain time, in the middle of, all right? In which you are something, holding fast to something, in order for somebody to rejoice. Now, before we get to the command, do all things, we know in the New Testament when it says, you must or you shall, that is law. We know that. That is not grace, that is law. Do all things. But for me, it always works a little bit better when I know why I need to do a thing. When if somebody says to me, you must do this, my immediate question usually is, well, why? And if it didn't make sense, then I'll do. All right, so let's start with the why. Why do I need to do all things? And the answer is actually in verse 15b, where it says, among whom you shine as lights in the world. So I need to do, because we shine. That's what the word of God says. It's very interesting here. Yeah? It doesn't say, say that you will shine, or eventually you might shine. It says, you shine. All right? You shine. This is what we are. This is what God has done for each, each one of us. He made us a shining star. You shine. Now, what, was, what does it really mean when the Bible says, let your light shine? I mean, have we got a little torch on our head and we walk around? What does it mean that I shine? Now, for, for those of us who, who, who love the Greek, I love the Greek, so I'm going to share the Greek with every word because it just expounds it, all right? It says that the light comes from the, from the, word, the Greek word foster, which means light giver or illuminator, a light source with a lens or a mirror. So that's what the word say, uh, means when it says, you shine as a light, all right? So you're a light giver or an illuminator. Now it's very interesting that the classical, in the classical Greek, the word foster also means window, all right? Now that's very interesting. What do we do with a window? We put it in a building too, so the people inside can see. But on the other hand, we also put a window a nice shop so that we can do window shopping for people to look inside and see what I see inside there. Do I actually want to buy that? All right. So remember, that's what the word foster or light means. It's for light to enter and for us to window shop. Now, there obviously the scripture that comes to mind is Matthew 16 verses 6, Matthew 6 verses 22 and 23, where it says, "You can throw them up there, James." All right. The lamb of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is dark, and when it refers to dark, it means dark of sin, all right? Your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? And you know, you get actually black light, don't you? Yeah, Papa shows you have black light. If you don't put the black light, you can't see those little things, all right? When we know shopping is done towards us, what do they see? All right. To put it in another way, every Christian is a witness for Christ. The question is just, am I a good witness or a bad witness? Let me give you an example. <clears throat> One night we were at squash a couple of years ago, and after in winter league we always have to supper together with the other team and so on, and obviously they drink a bit of beer and this and that. And there was one guy, and he's a Christian, but obviously he had one beer too many. And he started talking and swearing and carrying on in this. And the next man says, but you know I'm a Christian. <laughs> so one of the other guys started laughing. He said, which one? What, what sort is that? The, the swearing one. <laughs> so, you know, I just, I just listened to the whole story and I thought, my, my, you see. And he's a Christian. But at that point of time, it wasn't such a good example. The window shopping wasn't so nice. In any case, let ex let, to explain the light a bit further, let's look at the, another couple of verses. Now, the only other New Testament verse where the word foster is uh, used is actually in Revelation 21, verse 11, where John describes the new Jerusalem. It says, Having the glory of God 
and the light or her brilliance, the foster, was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. You see, it gives you the idea of I can clearly see, I can see right through. There's no stain of darkness there. All right? In the Old Testament, it's used five times in three verses. I'll give you one verse in Genesis 1 verse 16. It says, God made two great lights, foster, the great light, the sun, foster, to govern the day, and the lesser light, the foster, to govern the night. And then also he made the stars. So we get the idea here that, that light is, the word foster means for us to clearly see. It's crystal clear. There's no spot, and I can see where I'm going in the dark. Another idea or explanation of light in Scripture is very closely linked to truth or revealing truth. John 3 verse 11, uh, John 3 verse 21. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen. You see again, clearly seen and that they have been done in God. So he who does the truth comes to the light. 1 John 1 verse 6. If we say we have fellowship with him but walk in darkness, so I walk in sin, we lie and do not practice the truth. You see how darkness and truth is, is opposed here. But if we walk in the light, at his in the light, we have fellowship with one another, meaning with us and God and then with one another. So another part of being the light is revealing truth. All right? So the two explanations of among you who you shine as light is the following. It dispels darkness. It's crystal clear. It brings light to a matter. It opens a matter. And it reveals truth. It corrects deception. Light makes you see. It brings understanding. Takes away fear. Reveals hidden, uh, hidden things. It declares truth. Therefore, no lie can be of the truth. That's why we ought not to lie. <laughs> All right? If you can imagine the picture, it's like a procession at night in a crooked and distorted age in which torchbearers are going on holding high blazing torches so that those following can see how to walk in a sin-darkened world. That is what it means to you shine as the light. Okay. So what is the first truth we as Christians reflect? What's the first truth that we, what we, that we expose? The fact that Jesus Christ is the light of the world. That is the first truth that we reflect. Remember John preached about that, that the gospel is about one thing, that Jesus Christ is Lord. And in John 8 verse 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of light. Now here the word is not foster, but is phos. It means I am the one who makes manifest. I am the shining one. All right. It's very interesting. Jesus said that just after that feast, where they had the light on in the temple for seven days or something, and then they shut all the light off. It was pitch dark. It was pitch dark. They switched off all the lights, you know, the little candles. And just after that, that's where John 8 verse 12 is. I'm the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Now, very interesting there, just to add there, when Jesus said, I am, he used two Greek words. And those two Greek words is ego and I me. And they mean, I am the self-existing one. So what he was saying there is, it's I am who I am. I am Yahweh. That's what he was saying. I am Yahweh, who is the light that shines. All right? And then he says in John 8, verse 24, And if you, not, if you do not believe that I am he, that I am ego, I me, I am the self-existing one, you will die in your sin. All right, so that is the first truth we reflect. That is what we reflect. We are the illuminator of the truth that Jesus Christ is Lord. But more about the light. Ephesians 5 verse 8 says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light, truth in the Lord. Walk continuously as children of the light. Walk in truth. You see, it's our Christian walk. It's what Luzon read, our conduct. Let your conduct be without covetousness. My Christian character, that what I'm deep inside. How I, what I say, what I do, how I behave. All right? The truth deep inside of me as people do window shopping. 
point and reflect that Jesus Christ is the light. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6 to 7 For it is God who commanded light, the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, to shine out of darkness in a sin-darkened world and life, who has shone in our hearts, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. For it is God who commanded light, the light of the gospel, the truth, all right, to shine out of darkness, a sin-darkened world, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But once we were darkness, and we have this treasure, the truth of the self-existing one, the ego I me, in this earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. I mean, isn't that an amazing thing? Hmm? God shone out of darkness in our dark hearts, to reveal the truth. Now it reflects inside of me as it changes me. And, I, and, and, and then you do direct people to the truth. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. Again, the picture is that of a light tower or fire tower who shines its light over the dark ocean full of tempestuous waves of sin, deception and fear. The ship being tossed to and fro, but the people of the ship know, I can see a light there. There is a safe harbor. You see, they don't know where they're going. They don't know the left from the right. Do they see a safe harbor when they look at us? When they get in contact with us, can they see there's some safety here? There's some hope. There's some peace. Can they see that? Can they see when they come in contact with us? If I, if I can just hear there, and we point them to Christ and say, but here's a safe harbor. Come here. Is that what they see? Or by what we do? to be sent them further away into the ocean of damnation. Matthew 5, verse 16. Let your light so shine before men. That they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. You see, as we give light, reflect the truth that Jesus is the light. The only true God, the Savior, our Father in heaven, be glorified. You see, Jesus came to glorify the Father. All right? And he made himself known to us. And as Jesus gets glorified in us, the Father gets glorified. This explains why we do, because we are the light. That is why we stop at red robots, because otherwise there are consequences. Okay? Secondly, the where and the when. Where are we to be that light? In the middle, right in the middle of a crooked and a perverse generation. At the time of a crooked and perverse generation. Now the word generation describes the populace at the time, the culture, the sum total of those born at the same time. Exhibiting common characteristics. It's all of us. Okay? But what is this characteristic of this generation? The word crooked comes from the Greek word scolios. That's where we get the word scoliosis from. It's an abnormal curvature, a misalignment of the spine. It describes something literally crooked, bent, deformed, or warped. It stands opposed to what is straight. That is the generation. Um, in Scripture, scholars is used as things that are morally and spiritually corrupt, morally bent or twisted, crooked, without scruples, dishonest. Paul describes the outward perverted conduct of every unregenerate generation, crooked in mind and action, bent in all directions. 1 Peter 2 verse 18, very interesting. It says, 1 Peter 2 verse 18 says, Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. And the word harsh is the word scolios. The crooked, dishonest, ugly, cruel boss that's above you. All right? It says you need to be nice to him. Now the word perverse comes from two words. It means it's diastrophal. It means to separate in two throughout and to turn. 
So it conveys the basic idea of twisting or bending out of shape. It's like a piece of pottery that became distorted before being put into, into the fire. Or, or when the earth's crust got literally bent and twisted, you know, with a flat, when it got bent and twisted. That is, that is the word diastrophy. The idea is to cause one to depart from an accepted standard of spiritual values, a permanent distorted condition to dislocate or to confuse. This is the generation we live in. Perverted has a much stronger meaning than scolios. You see, scolios is a sense of people who are messed up because they don't know any better. All right? We were all born scolios. We were born all misaligned. Okay? The astrophy means scoliosis by choice. Now you become twisted because you want to be twisted. It's, for example, it's these people who are students in a hostel, they want to get out of the hostel, they can't get their deposit back, they put pressure on the hostel master to give, give, uh, get their deposit back, and eventually he gives it back, then they walk out and say, we were thrown out. Now that's perversion. That's twisted because you want to be twisted. All right? Now what's the application of all this Greek? Now this generation, <laughs> this crooked and perverse generation, you won't believe it, but you will find them in South Africa, in Germany and in Holland, in England, in Switzerland, in New Zealand and Australia. In America, all over, you get that same generation. Doesn't matter where you go. You know, it's very interesting. What brought me actually to this sermon was, <laughs> was a guy from Switzerland who um, I saw him as a patient. And I realized, you know, but he's got a South African idea. I said, how did that happen? He said, no, I lived in South Africa for so many years, but we moved back to Switzerland to... Um, uh, um, to be with the children and so on. He said, after three months, I wanted to come back, but now it's ten years later. He said, I'm now I'm here, and I'm looking for a house to live in Underberg. I said, you want to come back to South Africa? He looked at me, he said, yes. He said, you guys don't know what you have here. Now, I'm not saying South Africa is a good place. What I'm saying is that the crooked and perverted generation you'll find everywhere, just in different colors. So, we can expect an unfair boss, an insane and stupid decisions by governments, LGTBXYZ laws that will not go away and actually will get worse, perversion, the murdering of the innocent, liars, thieves, potholes, not stopping at red robots, and the general decay of society. You know, this sinking ship is going down and is getting worse. Because 2 Timothy 3 verse 1 says, But know this, that in the last days, perilous or terrible times will come. And simply for one reason, for men will be lovers of self. And you can see that everywhere. And as we become lovers of self, perilous times will come. So I'll probably share this, hopefully by knowing this, it will make it a bit easier for us to function in this generation because it's not going to go away, okay? We can expect this kind of behavior. We should actually be surprised when we don't find that kind of behavior. You know, we always wonder where we should go and stay. And I tell you what, I would also, I would really love to play, stay in a place where there's tranquil music, you know, and the birds in the tree and the children playing in the park and nobody crawls through your window at 12 o'clock at night. But you know where God wants us to live? He wants us to live in the middle of a perverted and crooked generation. That is where God wants us to live. So if you find yourself in the middle of a perverted and a crooked generation, you're living exactly in the right place. You don't have to move. You're right in the right place. All right? This is what God says. And you know, having said this, I know that some of us have to exist in man and manage under the most extreme pressures, all right, and trying times at work, at home, or wherever, all right? And it's really not easy. But you know what Jesus prayed in John 17, verse 15? He said, I do not pray that you should take them out, out of the world, but you should keep them from the evil one. He didn't say, all right, you know, Chips, you're safe, come here. You, you're safe, come there. He said, no, let them stay right there. But I pray 
that you protect it from the evil one. So the answer to the second questions, question, where are we to be the light, is very simple, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Thirdly, what are we to become in a, we have to become something in a certain way, all right? What are we to become in such a crooked and perverted generation in which we shine as lights? It says a blameless and harmless children of God without fault. Blameless and harmless children of God without fault. Karen, can I get that? <clears throat> okay. Last time I threw this all over my notes. That wasn't so good. In any case, blameless, from the Greek word amemtos, means irreproachable, faultless, with a defect or blemish. And this describes not being able to find fault in someone or something. The word blameless. The idea is that a, the idea is that a person is such that, now I'm always going to say he, now he includes she, it's gender neutral, alright, so, so I'm not going to say always he and she, it's just he, okay. In any case, so that he is without the possibility of a rightful charge being brought against him at the time of the judgment seat of Christ for believers. That's what it refers to. Blameless at the time of the judgment seat of Christ. 1 Thessalonians 3.13 So that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all the saints. Blameless on the day of Christ. 1 Peter 3 verse 16 carries the same idea having a good conscience, that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. So one day, when it's all before God, that they who accuse may be ashamed. I'm not going to fast. You're with me there. Carol? Yes, the psalm medal. Okay. Very interesting. Now the adverb, amemtos, blameless. You know what? It was found by the archaeologist on the Christian tombs of the ancient Thessalonica. On Christian tombs, there was written, Amemtos, blameless. This behavioral blameless is God's desire for his church. No accusation can stick. The same was said of Job in the Old Testament. There was a man in the land of Oz whose name was Job, and the man was blameless, Amemtos, upright, fearing God, and turning away from even, uh, from evil. You know, and even God called him blameless. That's Job 1 verse 1 and Job 2 verse 3. Even God said to the devil, Have you noticed my servant Job? Blameless in his generation. Let me uh, give you an example of what can happen to us very quickly and how we can become blameworthy. So again, it was squash, all right? <laughs> so we were playing and they all ordered the beers and so on and they ordered a Coke for me and it came in a big bucket they were just beers and ice. And I was just done playing. And I thought, oh man, they forgot the Coke. So I ran down to the uh, club house there. I said, listen, you forgot, we paid for the Coke, you forgot a Coke. The lady didn't say nothing, gave me the Coke, I ran up. All right, so I put the Coke down there. Played another game. And then I saw now the bucket got empty. And there at the bottom is my Coke. <laughs> and I thought, ah, oh, I scored a Coke. Of course, now I've got two. And as I thought, it's amazing the Holy Spirit. It, it's an example of how God wills both, how God works both to will and to do. As I thought that, the thought that came, but Martin, don't somebody has to pay for that Coke? I said, yeah, of course. So in my mind, so what do you think you should do? I said, no, I either bring it back or I pay for it. Yes, exactly. So obviously eventually I had the one Coke and later on I brought the other Coke back. But can you see how quickly we can slip up? How quickly? I thought I scored a Coke. That was my flesh part. <laughs> And then came the Holy Spirit and said, Martin, listen, somebody has to pay for this Coke. In any case, that's blameless. Now to the word harmless or innocent, it comes from the Greek word ekerios. It literally means without mix, such as mixing wine with water. All right? Spurgeon calls it hornless. Now that's a nice idea. You become hornless. It means sincere, unmixed, pure, unadulterated, unadulterated and it's used for uh, unalloyed metal, so pure metal. And it, it refers to an intrin intrin intrinsic character. It describes a saint with not one thing in his heart or motives which ought not to be there. All right? And it's also harmless. It cannot do no harm to another. That's what the word harmless means. Matthew 10, 16. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore be shrewd as serpents and innocent, 
harmless, vicarious as doves. Romans 16, 19. But I want you to be wise in what is good and innocent, vicarious, and, and innocent in what is evil, so, and contaminated from evil, evil that comes from engaging in it. So you become harmless, innocent of evil. Hebrews 7, 25 and 26. Therefore he, Jesus, is able to save to the uttermost. Praise God for that. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, innocent, ekerios, and contaminated, one who can do no harm. Jesus does us no harm. All right? Now to the words without fault. Now that's from the Greek word amomos. It means above reproach. Blameless was you just without blame. But when it says fault, there's now you're above reproach. So it's a step higher. There's no spot. There's no blemish. Okay? And it's usually used to describe an animal that's been sacrificed, uh, 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 you know, to, to God. All right? So that means it makes you fit to be sacrificed to the service of God. That's what faultless means. This is what you become. All right? Ephesians 1 verse 4. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame, above reproach, in him, in love. Colossians 1 verse 22. In order to present you before him holy and blameless, above reproach. All right? Very interesting. I saw somebody yesterday who's a bit in the dire straits. Christian guy eventually when we started talking. And he's got a scolios as a boss, all right? He really has a scolios. He's got a target on his back. But, you know, as we were just talking before, and he said something very interesting to me, you know, when I was already then prepare, preparing this. He said, I know that my work is above reproach. Above reproach. Now, what a, t- a testimony, yeah? He says, I know that my work is above reproach. And you know what was nice then? Because he's a Christian. So eventually we chatted, and I said, you know what? And even if you should lose your job, because he's got a target on his back. You know that your work was reprof- above reproach, and God was just taking you away to something else, and that settles it. You understand? But wasn't that nice to hear from the man? I know that my work was above reproach. In short, Paul uses three key words to describe how we should live. Blameless. No one can find fault. No serious accusation can stick. No serious accusation. So when it's all eventually opened, nothing can stick. Harmless, pure, high quality, unmixed alloy. What you see is what you get. I don't see one car and, and there's another car in there. You understand? What I see is what I get. Praise God, it was like that, a car in any case. Uh, there's no twist in the personality. And we do no harm. Faultless, fit to be offered to God like a lamb without a spot or a blemish. Do all things, we get to that now now, to become blameless, harmless, and faultless. I remember a couple of years ago, the buzzword in the church was, the church should become relevant to the culture around us in the hope of saving more people. Remember that, John, it was all this relevant stuff. Now, I understand what they mean by that. Yes, I'm also using now a relevant microphone kind of thing, and we're using this and not old hymn books. I understand that. <laughs> But you know what the word relevant means? Closely connected or appropriate to what is being done or considered. Appropriate to the current time, period or circumstances. Contemporary interest. The scripture actually says our lives should be a straight arrow in a crooked and perverse generation. Completely and utterly the opposite of contemporary society. My conduct should not be relevant to the society Ray Pitcher says the following, We will make an impact on the world by lives that are visibly, observably, measurably, noticeably, and obviously different from the people around us. We are to be different to make a difference. Not the same. We are different. We, We have straight arrows, not crooked and perverted arrows. This answers then our third point to become something in a certain way. Blameless, harmless, faultless. Now, if you think that's a tall order, now you must listen to verse 14. All right? Let's go to verse 14. Do all things without murmuring and disputing. All things. I think we would get a buy buy with some things sometimes. That would sound better, isn't it? Instead of all things all the time. 
I think most of us already fall flat there. But not with God's standard. God's standard is all things. A humanly impossible standard. But then God always presents us with impossible, impossible, doesn't he? Always. Matthew 5 verse 20. For I say to you, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, after the discourse of Jesus with the disciples, you know, with the, the rich young ruler, when, he's, when the rich young ruler said, but I kept all the commandments, and he was rich, and, say, and Jesus said, but you lack one thing, you've got too much, give it away. And he walked away sad, and Jesus said, it's harder for a rich man to go through an eye of a needle than a, than a camel. And the disciples looked, uh, looked at him and said, but who can be saved then? And Jesus looked at them and said, with men it's impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. Praise God for verse 13 today. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. So work it out, your own salvation with fear and trembling, because it's God who works. With God it is able to do all things all the time, without grumbling, without complaining or, or disputing. Now just interesting, we're nearly done, is that all right? The word grumbling comes from the English word gogusmus, uh, the Greek word gogusmus, and it actually means it, it's pronounced gongusmus, from where we get the English word gong from. Now that gives you an idea what grumbling is. It's a gong, all right? It's this low muttering, utterance of tone of voice, all right? And the dear often will complain, complaining in a bad tempered, nagging and discontented way. You're dissatisfied with your expectations and your circumstances. So you grumble, all right? Um, Gogusmus is found seven times in the Old Testament, and every time in a relation with Israel complaining to God about where they were at in the wilderness. Exodus 16 verse 8. Moses said, This shall be seen when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening, and in the morning bread to be full, for the Lord hears your grumbling or your murmuring. What does it say here? Yeah, murmuring. Which you make against him. And, and what are we? Your murmuring is not against us, but against the Lord. All grumbling. Against who is it? Against God. It's not against your boss. Grumbling, when you're dissatisfied with your act, it's against God, according to the Bible. Uh, New Testament. In the New Testament, it's four times used the word gongusmus. John 6, 16. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured or grumbled about this, he said to them, does this offend you? You see, they got offended. They started grumbling. You know that the noise of an elephant it's a, it's, a, it's a low rumble or a grumble. 1 to 20 hertz. You know how far it can be heard? Plus minus 10 k's. It depends on where you are. Grumbling is heard very, very far. It's just a thought. Disputing. From the uh, Greek word dialogismus, to debate. Where we get the word dialogue from. Alright? You don't stop grumbling. You end up in debating it. Now, now you're dialoguing. Alright? It's to reason, to reckon, to take an inventory, to deliberate in yourself. Now, that's not always wrong. Okay? Obviously, you have to think a matter through. For example, there's a good example of, of dialogue, of thinking. Psalm 40, verse 5. Many, O Lord, my God, are the wonders which you have done, and your thoughts, your dialogue, your debate towards us. That's positive. Psalm 94, 11. The Lord knows the thoughts, the dialogismus of man. Now, this is very sad, that they are mere breath. All right? So our thoughts, our debating about God, our mere breath. In the New Testament, Luke 4, verse uh, 35, when Simeon said to, uh, to Mary about the little child, he said, so that the thoughts, the dialogismus, the dialogue of many hearts may be revealed for the rise and the fall of many. But then it can also be in a very negative way, which means doubt, dispute, and argument. He said to them in Luke 24, 38, when he revealed himself after his resurrection, he says, uh, he said to them, why are you troubled and why do doubts or dialogue arise in your heart? Why are you debating whether it's me or not? Matthew 59, out of the heart come evil thoughts, dialogismus, murders, adulteries, fornication, thefts, false witness, slanders. James 2, verse 4, have you not made distinctions among yourself and become judges with evil motives of dialogues, 
you start debating in your mind. Grumbling is usually emotional. You mutter around to yourself. Disputing becomes intellectual. You have reasoned this through. Now you give air to your conceived opinion, outward audibly, usually with an arrogant attitude where those who assume they're always right. You think now you're in a right position, and I'll get up now and I'll say something. I just want to give you some current examples of grumbling and disputing. It's like when Dad says to Johnny, Johnny, I want, to pick you, I want you to pick up the dog's poo, all right? So Johnny does that quite diligently in the beginning. But after a while, he starts muttering to himself. Huh? He says, always me, this stupid dog, and all because of this eepal that he's eating. And then when the dog comes, he someone gives the dog a kick too, and he said, oh, we shouldn't have even gotten a dog here. All right, I always have to pick up the dog's poo, so he grumbles. One day, now he reasons it through in his mind. And he rises up against his dad in rebellion. And he gets up and says, you know, this is unfair. I always have to pick up the dog's poo. What about James? Why can't he pick it up? You always favor him. I'm the black sheep of the family and I hate you in any case. And he throws this big, big tantrum because he has to do a stinking chore. All right? Highly unfair. But that is grumbling. That is why it's so important, little children, that we teach him not to grumble. Another example. God has got you real in a dark work, working environment. The boss is crooked and perverse. And also those, so the others. You give him all the work, all right, the others are just lazy. And because you're the donkey there, you do the work, okay? So you're not playing golf with the boss. But instead of just doing the work and humbling, bringing God glory in all you do and letting your light shine, you start grumbling. And one day when you've reasoned this matter through that you're actually right, you get up, you voice your opinion, you say how unfair it is and how unfair you're being treated, you organize a strike and you burn a building down. All right? So these are examples of grumbling and disputing. Shall I give you one more little example? It's about the husband that comes home. Man and his wife is at him, you know, and they go for about an hour. And eventually he can't make headway, and he says to her, you know what, honey, let me go outside, and I'll come back again, and we'll, we'll pretend I'm coming home only now. So he goes out, he comes back, and as he opens the door, the wife says, and you're only coming home now. I don't know why these jokes are always about women grumbling. I'm not sure. All right. <laughs> we'll get Peter to do. But what does God think about grumbling and disputing? What does God think? 1 Corinthians 10 verse 10. Just go with me there, uh, John, uh, uh, James. Now, the chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians starts with warning against forfeiting liberty. Warning against getting rid of your, or losing your freedom. 1 Corinthians 10.10 10 says, Nor murmur or grumble, as some of them also mum, uh, m uh, murmured or grumbled, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our instruction, on whom the ends of the ages has come. And I promise you, the end of the ages has come upon us. Alright? Just listen to Psalm 106 verse 24. They, Israel, despised the pleasant land, so we God had them. They did not believe and grumbled in their hearts. They did not listen to the voice of the Lord. And the big example which you all know is obviously number 16, Korah verse 1. Now Korah the son of Izar with some others, now they took men. You see they organized the strike. You see they grumbled long enough, now they organized the strike. Okay? And they rose up before Moses with some of the children of Israel. They gathered together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, You take too much upon yourselves. Now look what Moses says in verse 11. You and all your company are gathered together against the Lord. And what is Aaron that you murmur against him? Can you see we're grumbling, grumbling and arguing against who it's aimed? It's aimed against God. Then it came to pass that as he finished speaking all those words, that the ground split open under them. So they and all those with him, that's verse 33, so they and all those with him went down alive into the pit. The earth closed over them, and they perished among the congregation. And fire broke out and consumed the other 250 men who were offering incense, who were partaking of the strike. And I think it killed up to 14,000 that day in Israel. Because of somebody that grumbled, 
then decided I'll debate and argue about this thing and I'll organize a strike. And look what happened. I think God has been very, 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 very gracious towards us over the last 2,000 years. Why does God see this so serious? Why? Because a grumbler despises who God has got him at. He then does not believe it is for God's glory and his own good. Plain unbelief. He does not listen to the voice of God. He then starts debating and arguing and ends up with open rebellion against God. Grumbling not held in check ends up in open dispute, argument and rebellion. And what does he do to us? Or what does it show to the world when I grumble? It shows the world I deny God's sovereignty because Psalm 115.3 says, God does as he pleases. God doesn't do how it pleases us. He does as he pleases. It disrupts this unity in a church usually or in a place and discredits their testimony. It shows the world that I'm dissatisfied with God. God does not know what he's doing in my life. And I grumble and argue about where I'm at. That's what it shows to the world. It shows to the world the God that I serve has not got me in a good spot and he doesn't know what he's doing. So our fourth point is in to order to become blameless, harmless, and faulted is by doing all things without murmuring and disputing. All right? Do you know what's the antidote for, for murmuring and grumbling and disputing? You know what the antidote is? 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18. Can you throw that up quickly, James? It says there, 1 Thessalonians 5. All right, I'll read it. It says, as you got it, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks. That's what it says. So in every circumstance, rejoice, and you pray, and you thank God. All right? Now, it's nearly now, nearly done. All right? <laughs> Finally, verse 16, it says, ah, yeah, verse 16, it says, and that's our point number five, hold on to something. All right? It says in 16, holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ. They have not run in vain or labored in vain. Holding fast the word of life comes from the Greek word epikontos, epikontos, and it's got two meanings. It's holding fast, faithfully preserving the Christian faith, and holding forth. So offering it as a sharing to others. That's what that word means. So I hold fast to it, and as I hold fast unto the word of life, I also offer it to the person next to me. All right? You can hardly hold it out if you do not hold fast that Christ is Lord. As I hold fast the gospel, as the gospel changes me from the inside out, my character, I hold out this life changed by the gospel as light to others. You know, as we get older, and over because of God having us in the pressure cooker, and he changes us, and become, we become actually a bit more humbler, and a bit more nicer, and a bit more lovable, it's not because of your genes. It's because of what Christ does in our hearts. It's not because of our genes. <laughs> because man left to himself becomes just more ugly as time goes on. He doesn't become nicer. He becomes uglier. So if eventually somebody says to you, man, you're such a nice guy, so say, well, praise God for that. All right? Okay. It's not your genes. All right, so that's holding forth and holding fast. I offer my life, okay, that I've not run in vain. And I just want to read you what a person wrote about that, Adam Clark. I don't know who he is, but he said the following. It alludes to the case of a weather-beaten mariner, and there are thought of a pastor, of John. It alludes to the case of a weather-beaten mariner who has been long tossed on a temp tempestuous sea in hazy weather and dark nights, who has been obliged to run on different tacks, and labor intensely to keep this ship from foundering. But at last, by the assistance of the luminous fire on top of the tower, directed safely into port, live so to glorify God and do good to men, that it shall appear that I have not run and labored in vain for your salvation. That's why I like the motto of our church. I don't want to know anything else but Jesus Christ, I mean crucified. That is our light that's shining. And for John, as he steers the ship, that he has not run in vain one day. All right? 
And so all of us as we witness. As I said, and I think this is every pastor's heart for his congregation. Not to stand disappointed one day at the day of Christ, but as steer the ship safely into port. Let not your life be run in vain, because no labor in Christ is in vain. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 58. Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the word of the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not vain in the Lord. You see, instead of developing this fortress mentality about surviving in this deprived world, withdrawn into our churches and family away from an evil world, God would encourage us today to let your light shine. Amen. Let your light shine. Don't go and, oh, it's such a bad world outside, and oh, we must just stay. Man, go and do what you need to do, but let it shine. Make it a straight arrow. Uh, Hilt and there you are with your goats. It's a straight arrow. No, it's a straight, <laughs> it's a straight, it's a straight arrow. Whatever we, every, let it shine. Let it shine. You know, think of it. When I was all darkness, if somebody didn't put his light next to me, how would I have got a safe? If I wouldn't, was able to do window shopping and see, but I can see inside this life, and this is what I want, how would I have ever been saved? All right? Let your light shine, man. Let it shine. Amen. Just let it shine. Have a straight, straight life, honest, blameless, irreproachable, harmless. Let it shine. And let it shine in this perverse and crooked generation. I promise you, they do not know where they are going. They don't. They're dislocated, mal maligned, <laughs> and perverted. And we were all the same until the day when we met the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I didn't want to share it, but I will. You know, on Friday I had such a good day. You know why? I just prayed for one after the other. You know how nice that is. You know how nice it is when they come there and they're in fear and they're in, 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 in this and they've got that. And I said, let's just pray. Let's just pray. And we just pray. And there was this one girl, you know, Christian girl in the hall. And, and she suddenly started crying. I said, and now she said, no, my son has been diagnosed with this and that. Not a physical thing, another thing. And I listened to this whole story. I said, but this is just a name. It's just a name. It has to bow. And in the name of Jesus Christ. And you pray for your son, and you keep on praying, and we prayed, and we prayed together. And then there come another lady, a, a Hindu lady. She had a thyroid cancer a long time ago, and then suddenly she had this lump here. I, I didn't even remember. I saw her now the first time after three years. And, uh, and she told me again, and this and that, and all went well. They took the lump out. It wasn't cancerous. And you know what she said then, right? She said, but do you remember, Dr. Kram? I said, no, you prayed for me. It was three years ago. can't even remember. But... But man, let your light shine. Go out there. Let it shine. They do not know and they need to get safe. They need to have some hope. There needs to be some peace. But to have some peace, there needs to be peace in you. Hold fast to the word of life. Hold, hold fast. And then you hold it out to somebody else. And you tell them, but I know for say, Father. Amen. I know someone. I know someone. And his name is Jesus. I know him. And you know, as a light shines, you know every light when it shines, the candle is being used up, isn't it? Our lives are going to be used up. Here yeah, it says here in verse 17. And if I'm being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, let our lives be poured out, finished, waxed, waxed away, that was close, waxed away into the service of somebody else. You know, and at... Well, all right, I'll share it. But in case, the other day somebody said, you know, it comes now, you know, because I have this thing with my heart, I must not slow down and all that kind of stuff. But in case, he said, so what about Martin? I hate that. I hate that when they say that. But in case, no, you must this and you must uh, here and you must look after yourself. <laughs> and, and maybe you should go on pension and, you know, what, or whatever. And I thought to myself, but in my heart is, I want to work as long as I can. Not to make money, to be a witness. To be a witness, because there are people there that need to be prayed for. They do not know where they are going. They're going to die without the Lord Jesus Christ. And I hope He keeps me alive until the last one that He wanted me to witness to. Witness to. Huh? I mean, there's Peter Pollock, he's 80 something. 
And he pours out his life in the service of somebody else's faith. Now, you know Jesus said in Matthew 39, He who loses his life for my sake will find it. If you want to find your life, lose it for the Lord Jesus Christ. And finally, finally, finally. It's really finally. That I may rejoice in the day of Christ. 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 19. For who is our hope, our joy, our crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ as his coming? Who is my crown? Who is my rejoicing? Is not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ as his coming? Our crown of rejoicing will be every person we have witnessed to and to everyone to whom our light went out to shine the way to Christ when they themselves stand rejoicing in the presence of our one and only true God, the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll read that again. Our crown of rejoicing will be every person we have witnessed to, and to everyone to whom our light went out to shine the way to Christ, when they themselves stand rejoicing in the presence of our one and only true God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. That's it. Pray. <laughs> Let's pray. <laughs> Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, first of all, I want to thank you this morning that it's you who work in us both to will and to do for your good pleasure, dear Heavenly Father. I want to thank you for that, that you are working in us. Father, and then I pray, help us to do all things without murmuring and grumbling and disputing, that we may become blameless and harmless, your children without fault, in the middle of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom we shine as lights, Father. Father, help us to hold fast to the word of life, and that we can also then hold it forth to others, dear Heavenly Father. And on that day, that we will rejoice when Jesus comes back, that we have not run in vain or labored in vain, Father. And Father, as our life gets poured out, so what, Father? It's in the service of you to the glory of your name. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.